Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. In the second part of our two-part episode with Paul Westermeyer, historian at Marine Corps University in Quantico, Virginia, we discuss the origins of the Marine Corps and the Marine Corps' limited participation in the First Seminole War, as well as the Creek Wars preceding it. In this episode, we'll talk about the Marine Corps' contentious relationship with President Andrew Jackson and how the Commandant of the Marine Corps managed to save the Corps through a timely dispatch of Marines to the Florida War. We'll then discuss how the Marines fared in the Florida War, both on terra firma, the land, and when they had to go out into the swamps of the Everglades. Rejoining us is Paul Westmeyer, historian at Marine Corps University in Quantico, Virginia. The views expressed in this presentation are those of our guest, Paul Westmeyer, and do not necessarily reflect the official policy of any government organization. Paul Westermeyer, welcome to the Seminole Wars. Thank you. You've written the Marine Corps and Andrew Jackson had a complicated relationship. How so? Why so? Jackson himself was not a booster of the Marine Corps, to say the least. He was a complicated relationship with the Marine Corps. His reputation was exceedingly positive for a very long time, especially because of the Battle of New Orleans. So sometimes Marines try to associate themselves with him, but were individual Marines he was very close to. Daniel McCormick, who was the major in command of the Marines at New Orleans, apparently was relatively close and quite appreciated by Jackson when he was down there. And to the extent that Jackson placed Daniel Carmack in command of one of the New Orleans militia battalions instead of leaving him in command of the Marines and had Carmack's second in command command the Marines during the New Orleans campaign. Carmack himself was killed probably when a, a British rocket hit his horse. He didn't die right away. He suffered severe wounds that he died of roughly a year later. But Jackson, as I said, he was a booster of individual Marines like Carmack, but he doesn't seem to have necessarily held the Marine Corps itself in high regard. And generally speaking, he didn't hold federal troops in high regard at all. Jacksonians believed in reducing costs, reducing the Army. It's another case that you find in the United States history where you get a new government that comes in and reduces the defense uh, forces, reduces the Army, reduces the Navy, cuts back on all their spending, but then demands that they do more. One of those things was when Jackson becomes president, he creates and signs the Indian Removal Act of 1830, intending to remove all Native Americans that were east of the Mississippi to the west of the Mississippi, regardless of previous treaties. And that is what starts, that's the ultimate push for the Creek War and the Seminole War. Jackson has decided that these are going to be moved. From the very beginning, the Marines are involved in that, even with the Cherokee, because individual Marine officers are at Washington while they're in between command or they're being trained. And so you, they're a uh, small pool of federal officials who can be sent as agents of the president. That's something Marines have done from the very beginning as couriers carrying messages and so on and so forth. Individual Marine officers were sent as part of the uh, removal of the Native American tribes like the Cherokee. And we have letters from Marines complaining that they've been ordered to move a group of Cherokees, but they haven't been given enough money to buy them food or they, the locals are taking the t Cherokees' property by which they almost certainly met their slaves so, and not allowing the Cherokees to carry their property with them as they are moving them west across the Mississippi. That's sort of the basis of all this. Jackson himself recommended the dissolution of the Marine Corps, that it be disbanded and reformed merely as a regiment in the Army. He had uh, his Secretary of the Treasury do as an audit that found that the Marine Corps was a lot more expensive than an Army regiment of similar size, which was probably true because, of course, even though it was technically the same size, it was performing very different functions. An Army regiment wasn't as widespread as the Marine Corps, which would have attachments on almost every U.S. vessel in all of the different ports at all of the different Navy yards and so forth. Coming out Henderson, he spent a great deal of time trying to fight that back. What sets the Seminole War apart for Henderson? 
Well, what sets the Seminole War apart for Henderson, Henderson's a clever and interesting man. He becomes a Marine in 1806 or 1807. He has a great deal of seniority by the time the War of 1812 comes around. But at first, he's very unlucky. Despite his attempts, and all the Marine officers in the War of 1812, they're constantly trying to get themselves assigned to someplace where there's going to be a fight because they know that that's how they're going to get advancement. That's how they're going to get honor and glory. That's how they might make money. It's the best thing. What everybody wants is to be on one of the frigates or on one of the ships that go out and capture the British merchants because prize money, that's how you get rich. More prosaically, they want a chance to prove their worth. Henderson never quite pulls that off. He always seems to be assigned to some place where there's nothing going on. So even though he's quite senior as a Marine officer, by the time the War of 1812 is coming to an end in 1814, 1815, he hasn't really had a chance to prove himself in action. However, he has been assigned to the USS Constitution as the commander of its Marines. And that turns out to be an excellent thing for him because even though this action in 1815, it's actually after the war's ended, but they don't know it yet. The Constitution gets into a fight with the HMS Cyan and HMS Levant, two uh, Royal Navy vessels, a frigate and a brigantine. They're both smaller than the Constitution, and in a remarkable feat of seamanship, the Constitution captures them both. So at the very, very end of the War of 1812, Henderson gets a chance to prove himself in action in the Constitution's last big fight. Not not as big a deal as the previous fights against, for example, HMS Guerre, but still a very big deal. That's what enables him in part that his uh, reputation is sort of formed. Then he and Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Miller, who's the hero of Bladensburg, become rivals, but they both agree that the senior Marine who becomes commandant after Wharton passes away, Anthony Gale, they both agree he's completely unsuitable. He's thought of as a drunkard, and he's considered uneducated. He has a history of killing men in duels, but he doesn't necessarily have a great, he doesn't have a history of success in combat. He hasn't fought in a lot of combat. So Miller and Henderson work to get Gale, who is court-martialed and kicked out of the Marine Corps. He's our shortest tenured commandant and the only commandant who's removed for cause from office. And so Henderson is the next most senior officer. He gets the job then after Gale, and he's very, very smart. As I said, he's very good at the politics of Washington. He successfully fought off Andrew Jackson's attempt to disband the Marine Corps, but he realizes that maybe you don't want Jackson, who's the president, but also a particularly influential president, right? Not You probably don't want him on your bad side. And so as the Army finds itself stretched to the breaking point by Jackson's orders to remove all of the Native Americans to the west of the Mississippi, he steps up and says, hey, you don't have enough soldiers. Let's send in the Marines. We can add some Marines. The Marine Corps can provide a regiment right now to help you. And Jackson agrees and gives the order for the Marines to be formed up to be sent down there. The Marines who were part of the Navy squadrons down in Florida had already been involved in the Second Seminole War. They were landed from Navy ships, for example, the when the Second Seminole War is launched in 1836, Marines had been landed in order to help protect Fort Brooke from the squadron. Over 57 Marines landed. Marines had been involved from the beginning in various patrols and so forth down there. The Marines were already involved in that war, but now Henderson has said, hey, we're going to form an actual Marine regiment, and you can send us down there to do what the Army needs us to do to serve under the Army in these operations to remove the Creek and Seminole tribes from their homes. The Commandant leaves a sign in his door and heads for the Florida War. Couldn't he have stayed back in Washington to manage the Marines? No, it would have been quite difficult for him to do that because one of the things that Henderson was famous for was following the War of 1812, he was one of the loudest critics of Commandant Wharton who did not command the Marines at the Battle of Bladensburg. Wharton, the commander of the Marines at Bladensburg, as I said, went to the adjutant at the time, who was Major Samuel Miller. Wharton was back at the headquarters. Now, the first two commandants of the Marine Corps were not chosen primarily because of their soldierly qualities, but because of their political connections and their administrative capabilities. And frankly, they were both very skilled merchants. 
And I would argue that that served the Marine Corps better than some sort of a combat hero would have. Wharton had been commandant already for years before the War of 1812 started. He got the barracks at Washington built. He got the barracks at Philadelphia built, the barracks at New York built, at Boston built. And he was very good at this. And since we had almost no money, his ability to squeeze a dime, as it were, was quite the boon to the Marine Corps at the time. But the other thing that's unfair about it is it wasn't considered the job of the commandant to lead the Marines in the field, right? The year before, the the Chesapeake campaign and the Battle of Bladensburg happens in the fall of 1814, August, September 1814. In 1813, when the United States first realized that the Chesapeake Bay area was vulnerable and that we needed to protect the capital, Secretary of the Navy ordered the commandant to form the Marines at the barracks into a force into a detachment. It was an interesting detachment because they were both artillery and infantry. They had artillery and they were all trained as infantry as well, which was not something that was normal during the Napoleonic period. So it made them, even though there were only about 120 or so Marines in Samuel Miller's detachment, they had a lot more firepower. They were the size of an infantry company, but they had the firepower of a battalion probably because they combined an infantry company with an artillery battery. And then at Bladensburg, of course, they were combined with a detachment of sailors from Commodore Barney Otilla, and they were fighting there. They're about between the Marines and the sailors, you know, 400 or so naval troops that stood their ground and fought very, very well, so well that the British noted it. But Miller had always been in command of that detachment. It was never intended that the commandant would command that detachment. It was his job to stay back and direct all of the actions of the Marine Corps. But Henderson felt that it was unworthy of the Marine Corps that Wharton hadn't moved forward. So he immediately did that. Now, he and Miller had a great rivalry. And what was particularly interesting there is Miller, even though he had commanded at the battles of St. Leonard's Creek, and Bladensburg, where he did very, very well in both of those battles, commanding the Marine Detachment, he had never served at sea. He had never served aboard a frigate or one of the other sailing vessels where Henderson had. And so Henderson always contended that Miller was not really a Marine because he had not been to sea. Miller, of course, is one of the battalion commanders. And then after uh, Henderson leaves, Miller takes over in Florida as the commander of the Marines on the ground. So Henderson actually quite often tries to order Miller to sea after he becomes commandant, and for various reasons he's not able to. Their rivalry and their uh, dislike for each other doesn't end just because Henderson takes the commandancy. In fact, one of the first things that happens is that Miller resigns as adjutant after Henderson is promoted. Henderson strips the Marine barracks. He doesn't strip the fleet, and this is important to keep in mind, is that he doesn't take Marines at sea. It would be difficult anyway. The Marines are at sea. But the barracks guards, he really strips them down to maybe a dozen men at each of the barracks. Very small numbers commanded by a sergeant. And then he's able to get, they call it a regiment. It's organized into two battalions, but it's relatively small. It's, it's really only about... 38 officers and 424 enlisted men. So it's closer to a battalion in size, even though it's organized. All right, Paul, this is a big opportunity. What are your thoughts about the famous story of Commandant Henderson leaving a note on his door and heading off to Florida? I'm not a big fan of that particular thing because it's a bit condescending and a bit racist. The legend, for which there is absolutely no facts that I'm aware of, says that he left some, leaves a note on his door saying, gone to fight the Indians, something along those lines, similar to a gone fishing sign. I'm a historian, not a folklorist. There's an awful lot of Marine Corps legends that have no basis in fact. One of the things that historians attempt to do is to lock these down with our citations and say, okay, we know this happened, we can say it happened here, and here's the proof, and you can follow that up. And you can go to the archive, you can see the letter, you can see the X that proves that this happened or that, that indicates that it most likely happened. In a lot of cases, we find that, for example, the red stripe. There's absolutely no evidence that the red stripe on the legs of Marines have anything to do with Chapultepec, and tons of evidence that they don't. They wore them before the Mexican War, that red stripe. So that sort of thing is something that's sort of invented whole cloth just to be something interesting to say. They become eventually important in a sense because they become part of the identity of the organization. But it's important to recognize when that identity is self-created and when it organically grows out of events. 
Okay, pick up the chronology. From Washington, they head straight to Florida? Um, they don't go to Florida at first. The Marines are sent to Creek Wars first, the Creek conflict or the Creek movement, if you will, the campaign, throughout the summer of 1836. They don't see any combat there. For the most part, they find themselves rounding up small bands of Creek women and children and shipping them to the West. Well, while they're doing that, the uh, Marines attached to the West Indies Squadron are still in the Seminole in Florida, helping to garrison Fort Brooke, conducting various landings at Tampa and Tallahassee and, and running patrols and so forth, being involved with some conflict. In November, a group of Creek warriors who agreed to fight against the Seminoles on the part of the U.S. government and were officered by various U.S. Army and Marine officers, including First Lieutenant Andrew Ross. They fight a battle at a place called Wahoo Swamp. That's where Ross is wounded. He eventually is going to die of his wounds in December. He is, a, I believe, the first Marine officer, at least, killed during the Seminole Wars, Andrew Ross. He was singled out for praise for behaving during the battle with, quote, great energy and bravery. Andrew Ross was appointed from Louisiana as a sergeant in the 7th Infantry Regiment in 1809. He was promoted to lieutenant in 1813, but he resigned in 1817. And I did hear that was because he was having trouble getting promoted beyond the lieutenancy. He must have performed fairly well as become an officer, however, prior to that. He was appointed to the Marine Corps as a second lieutenant in 1821. That's not a very common direction. More often, Marines would resign and join the Army rather than the other way around because the Army had greater promotion potential. In the Marine Corps, all promotions were purely by seniority. So your only chances of being promoted, especially because almost nobody retired because there was no retirement system, so your only chance of promotion was if somebody died who was senior to you. So in that sense, sometimes you might hope for a bloody day of battle, as it were, which is ghoulish, but... Henderson seemed to have moved up fairly rapidly. Yeah, I think Scott's a better example. Henderson was where he was supposed to be for his age and rank at the time. Like I said, he was fairly senior despite having no combat experience by the time 1814 rolls around because he's senior enough to be given as a captain command of the Marines of the USS Constitution, which was one of the most important posts that you could possibly get in the Marine Corps at the time. That's one of the three or four most important places to be. If you're a Marine officer, that's it. That would be like somebody put you becoming a Marcent commander today <laughs> or commander of one mess. Yeah. Paul, catch us up on the chronology. Well, after the Marines had evicted the Greeks, they moved down to Florida when General Jessup, who was commanding the war against the Seminoles, requested reinforcements in their additional service. Jessup and Henderson apparently got along reasonably well. And Henderson was one of the senior officers down there. And so he was given command of a brigade, what was called the 2nd Brigade, which comprised the 1st and 2nd Regiments of Artillery, so they were operating as a single regiment, the 4th Infantry, the Georgia Volunteers, a battalion of Allied Indians, those Creek Indians that we mentioned earlier, and the Marines. All of these different groups were furnishing detachments that were then mounted on horses and used to guard the supply trains as they were moving throughout the area. And St. Colonel Samuel Miller was given command of all the guards of the various supply depots. So that was how they set themselves up. The important thing to keep in mind with the Seminole Wars is that it's following the pattern of warfare against the Native Americans that the colonists first established in Phillips' War which is that because of the mobility and terrain sense of the uh, indigenous tribes, it's very difficult to pin them down. And their styles of warfare focused on raids as opposed to pitched battle. The way that it was decided that you would defeat them was you would find their villages, their homes, and try to crush them. Basically, you would eliminate what you would call the sanctuaries. The villages remove their source of food and attempt to remove the civilian population that was supporting the warriors. In other words, to put it more bluntly and, and more cold-bloodedly, you seek out the women and children and you control them or kill them and you destroy the food that they have. And as you do that, the idea is that you remove the resources so that the warriors have nothing to do. And so that's what the U.S. military, the Army, is trying to do. And they're trying to bring these warriors to a fight 
and they're trying to find these sources. And so they're going on these long patrols, these long searching actions throughout the various swamps and lands of Florida, trying to get these bands that are attempting to move and stay out of their way while striking back. In that sense, it's of a war of attrition. Both sides are trying to inflict enough pain on the other to convince them to stop fighting and to give up. So Henderson's brigade is doing one of these long, big patrols when he gets very, very lucky. Near a place called the Hachi Lusti River, the Marines come across a large herd of cattle of the Seminoles. We say Seminoles, but there are almost two groups here. There are the Seminole, the Native American indigenous Seminoles, and then there are also these escaped slaves that are also in some ways part of the tribes and in some ways not. I'm not really an expert on uh, Native American culture, but there are multiple groups involved here. And, and certainly the American soldiers see it this way. They see them as distinct groups that they treat in different ways. So they find this large number of cattle that lets them know that there's going to be a large band of Seminole nearby. And they also find an abandoned camp. We kind of refer to it as a battle, but what we really have here is a pursuit as Henderson's brigade attempts to catch up with and capture or destroy this large group of Seminoles that they have discovered through finding their cattle. One of the things Henderson does right away is he leaves his Alabama volunteers behind at the abandoned camp to guard it and make sure that Seminole don't come back and get the goods. Because once you have the cattle, once you have these supplies, remember the idea is you're trying to strip resources from the enemy. And so they don't want them to be able to come back and get them. If they can't kill the enemy or capture them, they want to drive them into the swamps without any food, water, or means of attaining more, if they can accomplish that. So Henderson's main body of his brigade is trying to catch up to the main body of the Seminole and they come to the Hachalusti River, and the Seminole have realized that they need more time for their women and children and so forth to escape, and so they've decided to make a stand there, which is fairly common for their, their method of fighting. And so they take up fighting positions on one side of the river, and Henderson's Marines, Henderson himself, they have to attempt to assault across the river. There's really only two ways across it. There's a log that's gone across it that you can walk across, but of course, it's a log. If you've ever tried to walk across one, it's, uh, it's not something I would want to do while people are shooting at me. And then swimming, which is equally difficult, perhaps you're not as likely to get shot, but at the same time, keeping your powder dry and, and so on and so forth, not to mention climbing out on the other side. Henderson himself tries to swim the river, but has to turn back. It's too difficult. And so then he has to cross over on the log. The Marines manage to get across and eventually the Seminole who are fighting describe this break and run. What they probably do is they're like, okay, we've accomplished our goal. Now we pull out. Because as Henderson himself says, they pursued the enemy as rapidly as the swamp and their mode of warfare admitted. Basically, the Seminoles are doing classic delaying tactics. One or two guys stay, they shoot, you stop, you cover, you move forward, but they've already left. So they, they do that every few hundred yards, and, and that keeps you slowed down while their main body is getting further and further away. So the Marines fight a continuing action here until nightfall when the Seminoles are finally able to completely break contact with the Marines. The action sees uh, two Marines, a Private Joel White and a Private Thomas Peterson, who are killed, and four more Marines are wounded. It's not as clear how many Seminoles are killed and wounded. Henderson reported seeing three dead Seminoles, and they captured two Seminole women and three children, as well as, quote, 23 Negroes, young and old. They also captured over 100 ponies, along with their clothing, blankets, and other baggage, which was why this was considered such a success, is because it was an event that really stripped a massive amount of resources from this Seminole tribe, right? So that, that it didn't necessarily matter that the people got away, they were forced into the swamp with nothing. And if you've watched Naked and Afraid, you get a sense of how difficult that can be. But again, it's not so much a battle as it is pursuing a fleeing enemy through the swamp. Between other operations like Henderson, the Marines and the Army, the Seminoles indicate that they're willing to renegotiate and sort of give up their land and accept that they're going to be driven out of Florida. And this causes Henderson to believe that, okay, this war is over. It's important to keep in mind that everything in here, it's not necessarily 
that the battles are dangerous. The casualty levels were relatively low if you compare them to battles in like Tarawa, <laughs> obviously. But disease was rampant. The Marines, I mentioned before that the Marines had established a base at Key West. There, the Marine garrison there suffered 100% casualties to disease in the first year. They had to be completely replaced because everybody got there got so sick that they either died or were incapacitated. So they had to send them more. Just the disease in Florida at this time, it was just a really, really difficult post. And so Henderson, I think he had a feeling that the Corps had proved its point. He had been heavily praised. He himself was actually given a, what they called, brevet promotion to brigadier general. Brevet promotion, sort of an award at the time, where given a promotion, you can call yourself a general, but you're not really, I don't want to say you're not paid, because sometimes you are paid for it, and sometimes you're not. That's actually something that they have a lot of fights with the Congress and with the Treasury over, whether you're supposed to be paid for being a brevet rank or not. But it's usually awarded like, oh, you're a captain, we're going to make you a brevet major. So then you're treated as a major as far as your rank goes, right? Captains have to fight. It's not a permanent rank. You may or may not get to pay for it, depending on if Congress is being kind that year. It's not the kind of permanent rank that would happen later on. Henderson takes the majority of the regiment back up north and redistributes them and to the various bases. He leaves two companies, about 200 Marines, a little bit less than 200 Marines, under Miller's command. Eventually... The Army violates a flag of truce and captures Osceola, and the Seminole War sort of fades off. The Seminoles are never really defeated, but the fighting kind of comes to an end. And that's when the Mosquito Fleet, after Miller and those last two companies, they go back in July of 1838. By that time, all those Marines are back north. They're all out of uh, Florida. And what brought the Marines back in 1838? Well, in 1838, the Seminoles had, like I said, backed off. They did not officially agree to leave. They continued to retreat into the swamps. And so the war continued, but nowhere near on the same scale. The numbers are different. The Seminoles basically break into very, very small bands, and they're especially in places like the Everglades. So the Navy forms the Mosquito Fleet, which are small steamers, schooners, barges, and canoes with a crew of about 160 sailors and marines, initially commanded by a Navy lieutenant named McLaughlin, and working directly with General Taylor, who uh, succeeded General Jessup as the commander of the Army in Florida. And they're mostly working in the Everglades. Eventually, this Mosquito Fleet is going to grow to 622 sailors and marines. 130 marines in 1841 are in this Mosquito Fleet. They go on long patrols in the Everglades, Living in canoes in the swamps for months at a time is very hazardous. Again, disease is rampant. Food is a difficult issue often. But what they're fighting primarily is the terrain and the climate and the disease, not the Seminoles. When they find the Seminoles, for the most part, these are small bands, predominantly women and children and a few men. This isn't exactly a glorious fighting for the Marine Corps. Right. The name Mosquito Fleet makes me start to slap my arms to try to swat some insects. Not pleasant. Again, it's it's hard and it's difficult, but it's not fierce fighting. It's difficult slogging through some of the most difficult terrain on the planet to, to move through. There was one long patrol that lasted, I think, 51 days. But for the most part, there's a lot of slogging through the mud. And by this point, of course, we're to the 1840s, and the Marines are shifting their focus and thinking about other, the Mexican wars on the horizon. Marines on Navy ships in the Pacific Squadron are involved in conflicts in the Pacific, in South America. By the time we get to this point, this has become sort of a backwater of the Corps. All right. It started in 1838. When did it end? 1842, the Mosquito Fleet is disbanded. They never finish off the Seminoles. Like I said, they never end. They just decide that it's not worth it to keep looking for them. Paul, what have I left out, or what should I have asked you about? Interesting that you see a Marine leading indigenous forces with the Creek mercenaries or, or the Creek scouts, will, which is a, an interesting thing considering the later use of Marines with places like Haiti with the uh, Gendarme and so forth. 
I know that the training indigenous military forces is now a mission of the special forces, but you could have made a strong argument that that was a traditional Marine Corps role under its colonial infantry aspect. It was something that the Corps had done quite often and has done quite often. When Marines are involved with the training teams in Afghanistan and Iraq, they're really going back, in fact, further. Lieutenant Ross is not the first, right? The Marines that take Derna in the Barbary Wars, there are seven Marines and an officer, but there's also a band of mercenaries and several hundred Arabs that the Marines are leading in that fight. So this mission of indigenous military forces that the Marines are training and helping to fight, that's something that they've been doing almost from the beginning. What would you say the most significant impact for the Marine Corps was from participation in the Seminole Wars? The significant impact for the Marine Corps was that it smoothed over relations with President Jackson by showing immediately a willingness to support his priorities by saying, hey, we know you tried to eliminate us, but hey, we're here. We're going to go help you with the Indian Removal Act. The Marine Corps indicated right away that it was still in service of the nation. The Marine Corps is going to face multiple times. Jackson was its first most serious attempt to eliminate the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps had already survived, but it really nailed the lid on that survival by doing this and by immediately showing that ability to support the Army and to maintain its usefulness. For the most part, the tactics and concepts that they used, as I mentioned, had been developed already in fighting against indigenous tribes all the way back to the King Philip's War. This was not the first time that Marines had fought against Native Americans. They fought against Native Americans during the Great Lakes Campaign, for example, up north. They had fought against various indigenous around the Pacific and the Caribbean, and they had been fighting against a very similar terrain almost identical terrain, some cases, with the Patriots' War in 1812. So there wasn't a great deal of change to how the Corps fights that was driven by this. What was important was that the Marine Corps demonstrated, especially Marine Corps officers, declared, hey, we are just as professional as Army officers. We are just as prepared. The Marine Corps can create a regiment and can fight alongside the Army and can do this while still maintaining itself as naval troops. And so in that sense, it established the pattern that was going to be used during the Mexican War in the middle of the 1840s, where once again, much of the fighting is going to be done by Marines on board vessels, especially, for example, in California, where the Marine detachments aboard the ships of the Pacific Fleet become the largest body trained troops in California during the conquest of California. And Marines are going to be involved along the Gulf Coast of Mexico during the war. But also, when the Army finds itself running short of troops and needing more formed troops for Winfield Scott's march on Mexico City, Henderson is once again going to form a Marine force and send it down to fight alongside the Army. And then that's how we're going to get to the halls of Montezuma, as it were. Paul, you're writing this official history. What's the difference with an official history versus just a history that you read in uh, paperbacks in the bookstore? The official histories are the backbone or the skeleton of the Marine Corps history. We establish the facts, what happened, where it happened, when it happened, how it happened, so that later historians and Marines can learn from an accurate history, right? If you were trying to learn lessons from history, but your history is inaccurate, you're not going to learn the right lesson. And so establishing the facts is one of the most important things that we do. And that's where the official histories are. The period that I'm working on here, the the frigate Navy period, is filled with mythology and legend. Very few Marines know specifics. And so the goal is that when this book is finished, the Marines want to know about the Seminole Wars, or they want to know about the Mexican War, about the War of 1812, that they'll be able to open this up and they will find that book there. They're they're going to find citations to other books and to uh, the various primary sources that were used that will allow them to really understand those conflicts and so that we know where we came from. The Marine Corps today is pivoting back to a naval force and 
during this period, Marines' primary function is to act as an integral weapon system on a Navy ship. The Marines are there, and they are, in some ways, most versatile ability to project power ashore that the captain of a naval vessel has. So when a frigate, for example, goes to a place like Kuala Balu in the Pacific where pirates had attacked an American naval vessel, they can land and they can send these Marines ashore and they can go further than the artillery shells can go from the ship. They can go deeper inland. If you're shelling a village, maybe you hit the bad guys, maybe you don't. But if you send the Marines in, they're a more flexible and more discriminating tool. And they can go ashore to pull American citizens out of danger and so forth. So they become a very specific weapon system. On the ship itself, they help repel borders. They fire on enemy officers during battle. French Marine almost certainly killed Horatio Nelson during the Battle of Trafalgar. So you can see how useful having Marines can be on board ship if you can kill senior officers of that caliber. Paul, we're finally out of time. Thanks for joining us for the Seminole Wars. Yeah, so it was great to be here. Thanks. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep this show going. Visit our website at www.summonawars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars Podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted. The Seminole Wars Foundation, 2022. All rights reserved. Front bumper music, The Devil's Garden. Roast them, provided by kind permission of Reedy Youngman. Back bumper music, Second Seminole Win, by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman. All rights reserved.